Okay, hello. Uh, welcome to the WPPM podcast, Wind Power Project Management Master's Program at Campus Scotland, a platform where we discuss the latest trends and practices in the field of renewable energy. We are delighted to have a very special guest, Mr. Jose Pedro da Silva Suarez. He is an accomplished academician and industry professional with a strong background in energy transition and wind power. He currently holds the position of project controls manager for In Simply Blue Group. In addition to his academic and professional accomplishments, Jose also has a solid industrial background in management systems. And also, he was a former lecturer for energy transition and wind power in our campus. During the upcoming talk, Jose will delve into a very interesting topic, project management for early stages floating wind farms. Jose, floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Salvors. Uh, thank you for the invitation and the very nice initiative uh, having this podcast. Yeah, I will talk a little bit about um, project management for early stage um, floating wind. And basically I'll try to uh, mainly highlight what, the, what are the largest difference between um, traditional project uh, management and this uh, specific area. So in, um, in a very generic uh, project model, you have these uh, phases for, for a project that you have a pre-study and then you have a planning, you have the execution and the closure. And normally the pre-study is more like a feasibility study and the closure normally is connected with your uh, the end uh, of the lifetime of, of the project. So after passing all uh, the construction operation and uh, then uh, final decommissioning. Uh, for um, project management in early stage uh, floating wind, we are having the first uh, part pre-study is very similar. So we also do a site selection and we try to look into what are the main constraints and uh, what are the, the main advantages of having a site in a specific location. And of course, we do some kind of initial planning. This initial planning is somehow related with the planning phase itself. But I would say that most importantly, um, consenting, uh, all the consenting studies that you need to do uh, in, or in order to, um, to feed your environmental impact assessment and uh, all the initial engineering, I would count that as being a part uh, of the planning within uh, early stage development. And the execution itself would come a little bit after you, you, you are certain or have a little bit more certainty that uh, the development is actually going to, uh, uh, to work or so actually after you get some um, consenting uh, or get some permission, uh, you know, authorization from the authorities that everything is okay, so you can move forward, and then you can, of course, uh, try to allocate a larger part of your budget uh, in detail engineering. Uh, but it's of course very important that you secure some kind of power purchase agreement before uh, that, so you you can do your LCOE uh, analysis and you are sure that you are going to get. Uh, paid um, for your project. So after that, then um, in, in, and after doing this detail engineering, then the closure in an early stage uh, uh, project is more connected with what we call FID or final investment decision when a strategic partner is, uh, is invited to come on board and to take over the project. Then it might be that the company itself wants to have a small share of the project and that can be, of course, uh, negotiated. Um, I think that uh, it's very important to also highlight that we look at a different milestones. So this is not an unorganized work. It's a very structured work. Milestones are very important. It's very important that you subdivide your uh, project, that, that you have um, somehow sub goals. So you are sure that you are delivering um, what you are, uh, what you should the, the uh, delivering and having milestones is an excellent way to um, to measure your progress. Um, not confusing though milestones with toll gates, uh, which I think it's a, a common 
common uh, confusion in uh, in the field sometimes. Uh, so the milestones are what I just said, so more linked with sub goals and toll gates, they are decision points. So basically uh, more like a review or an approval of a specific pro uh, process. Um, normally toll gates are uh, linked with the end of a specific phase of a project um, or um, on a more daily basis, let's say, uh, they are connected with large investments because large investments, they need to be decided uh, by the board uh, and it's a toll gate. So if you don't get the decision, then you cannot really move forward with that activity. Uh, most importantly, uh, there's, um, there's also a, a lot of methodologies that can be uh, utilized when you look at project management. Um, and in, in our case, um, we are very focused on utilizing critical path method just because it's flexible, even though it's unflexible, it's also flexible, let's say. So, um, you you have uh, activities on the wake of each other, but because of the dependencies, uh, you, uh, you have some allowances for flexibility to move things around and, and think in a different way, uh, maybe create different scenarios. So if this would not happen, what would uh, this mean for the overall project? Uh, so this that's what we are using uh, the most as uh, methodology when we look at uh, project uh, management uh, specifically. Of course, we could use other methodologies, uh, but uh, we feel that this is the most applicable one. Um, maybe one thing that I can say is that um, in this field and something that I experienced is that um, there's no one fits all uh, process uh, for a floating wind uh, or even for a wind offshore if one can, can uh, go wider um, because the how does the process looks, for example, in the UK or Ireland, where the company I work for is experienced, it's not really the same um, in Sweden. So we need to adapt. We need to lo look into what can we do uh, and how, how, to, how, to, how to move forward following the necessary steps uh, in accordance to, to the authorities. Uh, some of these steps are also uh, might not be uh, uh, as widely um, known or as, wi as widely um, uh, to say published uh, as they are, for example, in other countries where, where you have a very streamlined process. Uh, and of course, in the Swedish context, we are trying to adapt uh, to the to the local context and. Uh, uh, do our best in order to uh, minim minimize the project, uh, the project time, um, and of course maintaining maintaining the budget, which is one of the most important things. Um, I think this probably sums up a little bit uh, what I have to tell you uh, about um, project management for early stage floating wind. Um, maybe some lessons learned from the experience I, uh, I've been <laughs> through. Uh, now I can just say that it's good to plan ahead, but also to have um, times between things. So if you want to procure a specific survey, do it within time. You need to you know that there will be a toll gate. You'll need to take it to a board to decide. It will take time. So do it uh within time if it's if you're looking into procuring something that involves uh, the the need of vessels also do it in time those companies uh, the number of companies that do those kinds of services is very limited they might be already busy with uh, other developers so you need to contact them maybe six months ahead is it's a good uh, rule of thumb also account always when you're uh, planning 
for time after surveys, for example, uh, for reception of uh, of reports, but also for a revision of those reports, uh, because you might have to send it back to the supplier and ask for clarifications. And the same happens, for example, when you submit your full environmental impact assessment that you will get um, the authorities coming to you and ask you to revise your environmental impact assessment and it's good it's 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 good that, that you already plan for that beforehand so you don't have any surprises yeah i think that's that sums up pretty much everything i had to say about um thank about you. the topic thank you it's a very interesting topic actually for all of us uh students of the program and uh, now I'm going to ask uh, the questions that I received from the students. Uh, so the first question is, what are the unique challenges of project management of floating wind farms compared to traditional offshore wind farms? Very good question. Um, I would say there's a lot of unknowns um, when it comes um, to, um, to process, project management of uh, floating wind. If we compare with the uh, bottom fixed. I mean, uh, uh, technology maturity, is, uh, it's something that uh, that's coming. Bottom fix is already a mature technology, which doesn't really happen when we look at floating wind. It's not mature, it's developing. It will probably reach maturity in five or 10 years, uh, but there's a lot of uh, unknowns. Um, and uh, of course, uh, we, we need to, to take into account that when we we um, we draw or design our, our project plan, uh, and also look into uh, what is the revenue that we are going to get from these uh, projects. Another aspect that may be interesting or important just to mention uh, is that the utilization of ports uh, with the right specifications uh, might be uh, a challenge with with uh, within the project itself okay uh, and the next question is uh, is the eia process different for floating than fixed bottom <laughs> uh, i would i would say uh, it's, it's the same but for now uh, we don't know if it's going to change um, at, le at least in my perspective, bottom fix have a, a larger impact on the seabed and the environment, mainly during construction. Uh, but there might be uh, unknown parameters that the authorities want you to investigate when building floating that would that will come in the in the near future. But for now, yes, the the EIA is uh, very uh, very similar. Okay. Uh, what skills do you think are the most needed in the industry at the moment? Uh, well, first of all, let me congratulate you because I think you chose a very good program. Um, because what I feel is that uh, there's lack of professionals that have a, um, a broad overview of uh, wind, power, wind power project management um, in general. So not only about floating, but in, in general, um, because you will find in the industry people that are specialized in a very specific area and they are very good at what they're doing, they're experts, but it lacks this kind of sensibility uh, for the, the wider perspective, um, which I think is a very good skill to have. And I think that the, the master program that the EU Albors uh, is studying uh, at the moment gives you. Uh, so um, good choice. And what are the main challenges that you see the industry is facing? Um, well, I don't think that the industry is facing any problems right now, but uh, I foresee that the, it will uh, in the future. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of, as I said, it's it's a new technology, so there's a lot of uh, uncertainties. Um, well, I, I would say that maybe one of the key aspects is uh, in terms of floating foundations, 
uh, are the the manufacturers able to scale to the um, to meet the needs of the developers? I'm not completely sure, uh, and I think that's definitely a challenge, a large challenge there. Another one, it's uncertain is, uh, for example, when it comes for uh, interaction, uh, wake interaction um, from turbine to turbine. I mean. Uh, uh, a uh, bottom fixed turbine doesn't really move, but uh, a floating uh, a floating uh, wind turbine will move uh, in in different directions. So it's uh, what what is the impact uh, that will have on load wise or losses wise? So that needs to be uh, understood. And more globally, then if you are developing a lot of different floating parks, then you will also need to understand those interactions. Um, another thing, another challenge that I think can be interesting uh, and it will come in the near future is, um, well, a route to market alternatives. Um, do you have enough or there's lack of them? Uh, and if you jump too late into a specific route to market, uh, are you going to be left out of the ball? So that's basically uh, what I see as being the main challenges. Actually, you, you gave us good topics, thesis topics now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, feel free to explore one of them. Okay, and the next one, how do you identify and manage risks in the earliest stages of a floating wind farm project? Uh, good question. Uh, I mean, uh, we, um, I, I think the, the, the easiest way to do this is that you have a workshop with, within your team, you sit down with the people that know the project, so the project managers of each of the projects, may, maybe invite other people such as the technical manager or the overall portfolio manager and have uh, other people uh, that are a little bit more knowledgeable about the risks of uh, floating wind. Have a discussion, look at each individual project, uh, try to categorize the risks. So basically look at likelihood, severity, uh, and see what is the level of the risk that uh, will outcome uh, from the combination of uh, these two. And then look at it and try to um, delineate or try to identify um, different um, um, mitigation alternatives, because there are risks that you can mitigate. However, there are risks that that are uncontrollable, and those you cannot really uh, do anything about it. But it's good that they are at least identified, uh, because they can have an impact on your uh, on your uh, project, nonetheless. Thank you. And. Uh... What technologies or softwares and methodologies are you using to optimize project management for early stage floating wind farm projects? Well, it's a difficult question. Uh, as I said before, uh, methodology, uh, so uh, critical path method is as, um, something um, that um, we are using in order to try to optimize our project management with the utilization, of course, of different scenarios. So we also try to, to look into different uh, possibilities. Um, and we utilize um, um, traditional software, one can say, to both look at project management and budget. You can, of course, there's there's a handful or much more than a handful of um, uh, possibilities in the market. You can utilize different methodologies. Uh, on that regard, I think that you are a little bit limited because it's a construction uh, project. You are also uh, very um, dependent on decision uh, of authority so you you have to do things in a specific way you can play around but you're quite it's quite stiff let's say um so i don't think you can utilize uh, this uh, very trendy uh, project management methodology such as uh, agile for example um but in terms of uh, technologies of course there's a, there's a lot uh, there's a there's a a diversity of softwares that you can utilize in order to uh, to optimize your uh, project planning. Okay, and 
what do you see as the future of floating wind farms and how do you think project management practices will need to evolve to meet the demands of the of this evolving industry or the question ah uh, that's a difficult question <laughs> um i see so uh, let's 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 try to break it down so see uh, the future of floating wind farms um i believe that um floating wind is uh, is the future of um uh, of wind power in general uh, basically because on land there's uh, there's a lot of conflicts of interest um, and most of the best places are already taken uh, and the ones that were not taken they also face a lot of challenges uh, by itself uh, bottom fixed is a technology that is already mature um, it's uh, it already shown its potential uh, however it's limited because you can uh, only utilize uh, um, deepnesses that go up to uh, 50 to maybe 70 in the best case scenarios so if you go beyond that if you look beyond that uh, 70 plus 80 plus uh, you end up on floating and most of the sea uh, is deeper than 80 meters. So I think floating wind is the future of uh, wind power, um, in my opinion. Um, how do I think project management practices <laughs> will need to evolve to meet the demands of uh, evolving industry? A very difficult question indeed. Uh, I think um, practices or uh, methodologies within project management uh, have been alive for quite a long time now. Um, they've been evolving um, maybe not to the standard we need but see that maybe in the future uh, artificial intelligence uh, can uh, can help uh, manage uh, a project in a better way so if you if you uh, if you have a, sp a specific uh, structure and then you just input it into an artificial intelligence uh, in uh, algorithm then it might be able to give you the best possible scenarios that might be something but you know you always need to adapt and i don't know if those kind of technologies can help you adapt as fast as you need to adapt okay thank you and the last question is about floating foundations can you get more into the uh, choice of the floating foundations what are the criteria uh yes a very good question as well i think uh, the first thing that comes to my mind is that uh, the the selection of uh, floating wind is very uh, site specific uh, we don't have a fits all solution uh, it might be that uh, um, that the spar boy is the best solution in a specific uh, um, area and in the other uh, maybe may, maybe you will look into a bar solution or whatever uh, that might be um, i think that when it comes to criteria that that's one of the things that you need to be aware of so uh, basically look at the local conditions waves currents um, the wind speeds as well um, then another criteria is about uh, the supply chain channels and how fast they can deliver. Uh, most of these technologies, they, uh, um, they have or they utilize cement or steel, um, which are in very high demand uh, by itself. They, they utilize huge amounts of both of these materials. Um, and there might be bottlenecks if you try to uh, scale up and develop as much as uh, we have seen that there's a, so much uh, so many projects that are aiming to develop in 10 years will the supply chain be available to deliver uh, so that's also something that we need to take into account and when it comes to material also the sustainable side of it what is more sustainable utilizing steel or utilizing cement also need to uh, look into the weight itself of the of uh, of the foundation uh, so um, or of the platform i'm sorry 
because uh, of course that that will mean that you would need to, to have um, um, boats or vessels that are able uh, to tow those kind of foundations. Um, what the cost is, of course, and very important criteria, uh, because uh, you, you try to minimize the cost as much as you can. Space needed in port, as I mentioned in the very beginning, and some of these technologies, and they tend to utilize more space in port than it's actually um, available at the moment. Um, uh, and on top of that, there's also um, that these technologies, they should be uh, um, neutral, uh, neutral to the OEM. So you should be able to put whatever turbine on top of, uh, uh, of it as, as you please. Uh, so you don't end up being stuck to just one solution just because, I don't know, a specific brand just goes on top uh, of, um, uh, of a specific floating uh, platform, platform. So that's what I would say that uh, are the criteria, but of course there's many other things that you need to take into consideration when, uh, when looking into what uh, floating foundation to, to utilize. Maybe the seabed characteristics is also something that's very interesting to look into. Um, so there's, there's so many things uh there's so many parameters you just have to make your uh, best just judgment um yeah not an easy one i would say okay uh i'm out of questions so do you have any word with prospective students of the program yeah, I mean, I, I would say that this um, topic of floating wind is a lot of interest uh, uh, in this. And uh, I guess uh, th there's probably a lot of unknowns, which it's very good if you want to do some uh, thesis work. Um, there's probably a lot of questions uh, that one can unleash to the table and give you a suggested topics and you can try to refine them into your own thesis topic and that that's what i would say uh, and again saying that you have chosen a very uh, good uh, uh, master program because this uh, because this master program, uh, as far as I know, will uh, will fit you with uh, the necessary tools uh, to, to face this ever evolving world of wind power. Okay. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you for this interesting topic and thank you for your time. And uh, hope to see you soon again in summer seminar, exhibitions, lecture here, maybe. Yes, sure. Thank you very much for the invitation once more. And, and yes, I hope to see you soon. Good luck uh, with your studies. Thank you.